The content you're about to enjoy comes from the archives of The Best You. We're devoted to the very best in personal development, with a platform and resources dedicated to inspiring and changing people's lives. At The Best You, we work with the world's leading writers and trainers on the evolution of the self and people whose journeys have been affected by their work and words. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co. Marissa Pia is a best-selling author, motivational speaker, and leading celebrity therapist and a pioneering hypnotherapist trainer. She's voted best speaker at the Awesomeness Fest. That's the Mind Valley Fest. She's named Britain's best therapist by Tatsla magazine. And Marissa has spent nearly three decades treating a client list that includes international superstars, CEOs, royalty, and Olympic athletes. Her engaging and amusing talks are peppered with anecdotes in a career which she has helped thousands of people to overcome profound personal issues. Well, I've worked with Marissa several times. Apart from this interview, which I did a few years ago, she has spoken at Inspiring People Talks. She spoke at the NLP Live Talks. So there are other opportunities to see how we've collaborated and we will be working together, I'm sure, in a very near future. The reason I wanted to interview her was because I just, the first time I met Marisa, I was just amazed how eloquent, how great, how knowledgeable she is. And every time we've shared her talk or everyone has seen her live, the audience have just been mesmerized. So I think she is an amazing speaker. Uh, she has a lot of knowledge, as I said. And if you're interested in uh, finding out more about hypnotherapy or, you know, learning from the best, this is going to be a great interview. You're going to love Marisa. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Bernardo Moya. Welcome to Inspiring People. Today we're here with Marisa Pia, who's a psychotherapist, hypnotherapist, and she's a regular columnist for many magazines and publications, and she has an extensive client list, which include actors, actresses, uh, sports celebrities, and all sorts of people. Hi, Marisa. Hello. Thank you for being here today. It's a pleasure. Um, introduce yourself. Tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do. Uh, well, I'm Marissa. I'm a therapist, a very unconventional therapist. Luckily, I've been a therapist for... Gosh, 25 years longer, and I sort of developed my own style, which is certainly different, but um, incredibly effective, and I have a, it's actually a great life, because I get to travel all over the world, work with clients, write books, write my columns, work on TV, I have quite a charmed life. Beautiful. Yeah. And uh, tell me, what, what was, where were you brought up? What part of uh, um, I actually come from Newcastle, but mm -hmm. I was raised in Cambridge, went back to university in Newcastle, and then went straight from Newcastle to L.A. and lived there for many years. Came back here and worked here, then went back to L.A. two more times to live and work, and now I'm, I'm mostly here. Um, so what was, your, what was your early years like uh, at home with your family? In, my father was a headmaster of my school, so that was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Cambridge, which was really nice. It was good. You know, my dad's a really lovely guy. He was My dad always helped everyone. That was his motto. He was really into helping people. He was a bit of a saint, actually. But in many ways, he he really influenced me to want to help people. But he helped by doing stuff for them, and I helped them in a kind of more direct way by teaching them to do stuff for themselves. But he was a great influence on me, still is. Um, what, what was your school life like? Were you good at school? Did you enjoy it? Yeah, um, it was my school life was interesting because I was never sporty and I was not ever in any of the sports teams and I was told I was useless at sports. So when I left college and went to work for Jane Fonda and became her very best exercise teacher ever and I was on television here on Newsnight teaching aerobics I was thinking wow I hope all my teachers that said I was useless are looking at this because <laughs> I made a lot of money being a, um, a fitness trainer before it was even fashionable so school was interesting I went to a really nice school that was quite nurturing, but it, but it taught me a very early lesson that teachers, aside from my lovely dad, do a lot of damage. Not all of them, but you really need to be um, nurtured at school, and it's hard for a big school to nurture you. Mm. Um, were there anything that you excelled at at school, which they told you were good at? Is art. That? I was art. really, really good at art. But mm. then I don't do art at all. But my daughter's an artist, so it's interesting that she's picked that up. But then at her school, her art teacher 
really diminished her and told her never to apply for a good art college. She wouldn't get in. And I had to do a lot of work and really undoing the damage that her art teaches. And that was at a private, really expensive school. So I learned that again, that for every great teacher, there's a lot that do a lot of damage. Mm. You know, in therapy, you're always undoing damage. And the damage I undo comes from parents and teachers and other people too. But parents and teachers are often unwillingly put people down and say, you'll never do that. You're not good enough at that. You can't do that. And it becomes a kind of tape that people play over and over again. Um, so when you finished school, what happened then? What, did you know what you wanted to do? Uh... Um, well, I wanted to be an artist, but my parents were determined that I wouldn't be an artist because they thought I'd end up, you know, being some kind of unemployed, living in a garret, probably drug addict, which is so not me. So they wouldn't let me go to art school. So I went to university to be a teacher like my dad and then decided that wasn't enough. So I started training to be a child psychologist. But... Actually, when you're 22, being a child psychologist, especially in Newcastle, is infinitely depressing because everyone you work with is so damaged. And you can't, you have three patients, mum, dad, child, and you can never really help them. Well, I found that you couldn't. So I gave all of that up and went to LA and became an aerobic instructor instead, which was um, much more fun than being <laughs> a child psychologist in Newcastle. How did that happen? Well, Interesting enough, my boyfriend at the time was a footballer long, long before WAGs ever existed. And he got sold from Newcastle United to um, the Tampa Bay Rowdies, which was kind of cool. And that's how I went out to America. That relationship didn't last, but my love affair with America certainly did. And because he was a a footballer long, long before it was fashionable, I used to work out with him and run with him and train with him. And no one was doing that. And so when I went out to L.A., they kind of snapped me up because I had an English accent and I was really fit. And so then I had my second job, which was being an aerobic instructor, really pretty much to the stars. It was the most amazing life. But after a couple of years, I really wasn't using my brain. But what was amazing is that every other girl in my class was bulimic or anorexic or exercise compulsive. And actually a lot of guys, too. And I remember thinking oh, I could have a business here. I can train all these people all day and then I can hypnotise all these um, people with eating disorders in the evening. So I went to an amazing hypnosis school in LA, trained to be a therapist. That's where I got all my training. I trained with this absolute genius. I was very lucky. And then I began both businesses, but immediately I had to give up the exercise because I just couldn't give people second appointments. I had people coming out of my ears. I was working seven days a week. There were so many people that needed kind of therapy I was doing that I had to give the classes up which I did regret still do but I couldn't do them both so those years you were then in LA then you decided to come back to the UK yeah then I came back to the UK primarily because I was decided to have a baby and I didn't really want to raise her in LA so I came back here and I had the same business here got an office in Harley Street I very quickly stopped specialising in bulimics, anorexics and exercise compulsive, only because people would ring up and say, I know you only do that, but I've got a dental phobia or cat phobia or dog phobia. And it was like, oh, like, this is great. This is actually a welcome relief from hearing about how many people were sick all day and what they did to be sick all day. So then I stopped specialising and and generalised for a long time. And then I actually got to work on a lot of television shows behind the camera so I'd work with people who are going into I'm a celebrity and hypnotise them to be able to <coughs> touch the bugs or eat the bugs. And then amazing, I got asked to be in front of the camera. So I got asked to be on a show called Celebrity Fit Club UK. And then I actually got asked to be on the American version. So I commuted backwards and forwards. And, and that was great fun. And then I wrote some books and wrote for magazines. And then I sort of went back into specialising, but it wasn't on purpose. But now I find that my clients come in for weight, fertility, confidence and lots of fears and phobias and other things too. So lack of confidence. How do you help somebody become more confident? Well, you know, I always look at babies, having had one myself, and babies are born with so much confidence. If you push the pram, people come and go, oh, your baby's so cute. They don't go, don't look at me, I don't like attention. They love attention. If ever you sat around a pool, you'll hear all these guys saying, Daddy, look at me, Mummy, look at me. So we come into the world loving attention. I mean, that's the first experience you get. Everyone looks at you, the doctor, the nurse, the midwife, parents, grandparents. So 
what I tend to do is is reactivate that innate confidence that you were born with and at the same time have a look at why you've lost your confidence it's always it's, it's there will be something very specific that causes people to lose their confidence but they don't really lose it I believe it becomes submerged under all kinds of negative beliefs and when you remove them the confidence can come back so I give people back what they were born with which is better because then they don't go away and think well I've never had it they go away and think yeah of course I had it and I'm I can have it back again can anybody become more confident yeah absolutely the thing with your mind is and the mind is really simple your mind does what it absolutely thinks you want it to do so if you fear rejection if you've been humiliated at school or by you know as one of my clients was telling me that she went she went to work on her first day her boss shouted out across the floor she's useless she'll never be good at anything and when you're humiliated like that the number one job of your mind is to make sure you never experience that again so your mind is always working to move you away from anything that causes you pain and it has to find out what causes you pain to move you away from it So people who've been rejected then spend their life avoiding rejection, avoiding humiliation, and they won't put themselves forwards. But when you take that away and show them that you can't be rejected, the only person who can truly reject you is you. Somebody can not give you a job and not like you, but they can't really reject you because they don't really know you. And then, and so I teach people that there, there's no such thing as rejection. Nobody can diminish you. And once you believe in yourself, then it doesn't really matter what other people think. And people get very concerned that that's arrogance. But it's not. It's just a self-esteem that radiates out from you. So you can't really be diminished. You can have bad days, but we can all feel incredibly confident and incredibly self-assured. And the great thing is that people love that. You want to be with people who are self-assured. Mm-hmm. Like, if you were going to see a doctor, you want him to say, I'm the best doctor in the world. You want him to say, oh, I'm not really that very good. Um, I'm okay, but I'm not great. I mean, who's going to go and see a doctor like that? Yeah. When you're flying with a pilot, you want to say, I'm the best pilot BA has got. Not, oh, I'm not very good. I hope I can get you through this turbulence. Mm-hmm. So people who are confident make us feel really, really at ease. And we like that. And also, confidence is really very sexy, too. Men love confident women. So we should all be more confident. And... Um, how have you helped people with weight issues? Bulimic well, or? yeah, that's interesting too because you can't get babies to overeat. Babies come onto the planet with a belief that goes, food's always there, I'll have it later. I mean, in the womb, they don't wait to eat. And when they're born, you feed them whenever they're hungry. So babies leave food. They don't have any concept of good, bad, naughty. But then, of course, you get people that make you eat horrible food and won't allow you to eat nice food. And then the brain has the belief, which is, I can't have what I want got to have what I don't want so when you have a diet that says every time you want a cake eat an apple you think I don't want an apple I'm going to eat four cakes now just because I can't have them so again I I give people back that belief that food will always be available you've got 60 years to go on eating you'll always have another day to eat and I had a lot of issues with food you know being an exercise instructor in LA you would because you've got to be really thin and Actually saying to myself, I will always have another day to eat, I have to say that actually changed my life. Because I could, instead of thinking, oh my God, that's my favourite, oh my God, I love that, I think, yeah, but I've got 60 years to eat it, I'll have it tomorrow, I'll have it next week, I'll have it when I'm 85. And it took away that need to think, I've got to have it because it's there, or it's free, or it's available. So again, a lot of it is giving people back the innate normality about food that they were born with. And then also, it's a lot of teaching them. For instance, you only eat something if the picture in your head is right. So if someone spat all over your food or sneezed on it, you couldn't eat it, could you? Even if you want it. If someone bled all over your lunch, you're not going to eat it. I'm going to put the blood to one side and eat it. But you see, food companies know that you eat if the picture is right, which is why they call the rubbish food in the world happy meals and fun size and farm fresh, barn enriched, Swiss chocolate. They called it Afghanistan chocolate. You wouldn't eat it. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I get people to make the picture wrong for wrong food and right for right food. And then there's no issue. There's no fighting. You just give it names that make you not want it. So if you call jellies boiled up cow's feet, which they are, mm-hmm. you can't, they kind of lose their appeal. If you call fizzy drinks osteoporosis in a can, 
it, it sort of loses its appeal. So when people have got really particular addictions to food, I take that away, mentally and physically, by giving it different names. But also, you need to convince the brain that you don't want it. It's the same thing. Your body would never go, yeah, fill me up with chemicals, boiled up cow's feet and masses of sugar. That's what I want. But the mind does get very high on those chemicals. And, of course, the mind thinks you want them. You know, no one says, oh, I'm so depressed, I'm going to grill a bit of trout now, and a bit of spinach. They go, I'm so depressed, I need chocolate cakes, biscuits, toast, all the stuff you got as a baby that made you happy. But it's infant food, so you convince the mind that the body doesn't want it, and if the mind doesn't want it either, then, then you've cracked it. So that's what I do, I get both the mind and body to not want it at all. If you're interested in working with me, contributing to the magazine, maybe speaking at any of our many events around the world, partnering or licensing The Best You, go to www.thebestyou.co. Marisa, you, you're doing very well with your with your latest book about getting pregnant and yeah. succeeding. And, yeah. um, and I'm very interested. Tell us about it. How, how does it work? Well, I was told I could never have children under any circumstances, which was incredibly depressing. But my only saving grace is I refused to I refused to even let those words in. And then, of course, I did get pregnant. And then I was told that the, my baby would die or she'd be born ill. And she was perfect. And then I realized then how important it is not to listen to that stuff. But it's the same thing. If your mind's number one job is to move you away from pain and you go through life saying for the first 15 years of your fertility, uh, oh, don't, you know, use a condom, I don't want to have a baby, or for God's sake, be careful, I can't have a baby right now, or we can't afford a baby, the house isn't big enough, I'm not going to get promoted if I have a baby. If ever you have a pregnancy scare and your teens go, please, God, don't let me be pregnant by the end of my life, then, of course, your mind is looking for that. And when you use birth control, you say every month for 15, even 20 years, I don't want a baby. And then people wonder why they have what's called unexplained infertility, which means there's nothing wrong with you physically, but there's something unexplained that's causing you not to conceive. And that's the belief that you don't want a baby. Once your mind believes pregnancy is best avoided, it can do it can switch off your fertility completely. And once you get the mind to believe, no, that was then, this is now, I want a baby, I'm ready for a baby, you can actually switch on fertility. So animals don't have infertility because they never get to delay or put off having a baby. Tribes don't have infertility. You couldn't go to Ghana and see one in every four women not having a baby. But in the West, one in every three to four couples can't conceive. 40% of that is male. and But there's a lot of things you can do for male infertility too. So what I do is boost fertility mentally, physically. That There's a lot of things involved but, but the mental side is the most important. Even with IVF, you know, when people go for IVF, they say, well, we have a 20% success rate. And what women hear is, you have an 80% failure rate, and I'm going to be one of those 80%. Statistically, of course I am. But actually with IVF, the, the 20% success rate is only at implantation stage, because if you collect eggs and fertilize eggs, that's a 100% success rate. So when my clients go for IVF, I give them a recording to listen to that communicates with the intelligence of the embryo and tells it to implant. And people forget that, you know, the cells in your body are so smart, they actually know what to do. Every organ in your body will respond to your thinking. We know that because when you think of eating, you make digestive enzymes. When men think of sex, they get very physical reaction in their body because your body responds to the thoughts you think. That's why if you watch a film about pain or mutilation, you kind of recoil because you react to it. So because every thought you think has a physical reaction in the body, the more you think about ovulating the most amazing egg, having it fertilized, rehearsing with it, moving down the fallopian tube and implanting, you are actually massively boosting your chance <coughs> of getting pregnant naturally, but also with IVF too. The results have been phenomenal from what yeah. I gather with loads of IVF really clinics uh, following and your work and what you're doing. Yeah, lots of IVF clinics use my method and a lot of them say, look, just keep my client consistent. A lot of my IVF clinics like their clients to listen to my CDs while they're going through the procedure. And in fact, recently one of my clients said that everyone in her, her embryologist ran out of the room and came back again with the camera crew and I've never seen an embryo 
this amazing quality. You can't even get this in a 25-year-old. And she was 45, and they were saying, what have you done? And she said, I've done Marissa's technique. They said, it's actually impossible to have an egg of this quality. But it's not impossible because the body will respond to the thoughts you think all the time. Mm. that's why you know when Roger Bannister broke that four minute mile they said it was impossible within a year 27 more people did it because once one person does the impossible everyone else does it too and with fertility you can actually achieve what's classed as impossible because what doctors tell you is possible changes all the time Mm. I mean when Mandy Elwood had um, eight um, embryos they said it's impossible for anyone to to carry eight babies to full term. Two years later, someone did just that. And since then, I think there's eight different women all over the world who've had eight babies successfully. Mm -hmm. So you can't always believe what medical people tell you. Unbelievable. I mean, they mean well, but but they're wrong. Mm -hmm. That was your relying on nature. And obviously what's what's common sense really, isn't it? Yeah, it's like when people say to you, well, your husband's only got 50,000 sperm, you can't get pregnant, you need 500 million. But then they also tell you that if you have sex with that penetration, you get pregnant from one sperm. So it's like, well, how does that work then? Because those beliefs completely cancel each other out. Yeah. And it's like telling people that they're too old to have a baby, but women have had babies in their 40s for hundreds and hundreds of years and will go on doing that. So it's important to believe that what you hear doesn't apply to you. And even if it does, nothing can influence your body the way your mind can. The mind is so powerful. We know that because if you go somewhere like Haiti where there's all voodoo and think, oh, this is all nonsense, if you live there, it actually starts to affect you because you're affected every day by what you think and hear and see and believe. But the good news is you can change what you think and hear and believe like that. And once Mm. you change that, it will change your life. Yeah, it's about breaking down those limiting beliefs, isn't it? Yeah, and, and most beliefs are limiting. And, and you see, when you question a belief, you no longer hold it to be true. So when you have negative beliefs, like no one in my family can get pregnant, everyone in my family is fat, everyone in my family is stupid and can't get a job, you have to think, why do I believe that? A, a, who told me that? And what do they know anyway? And, and just because it's true for them, why should that ever have to be true for me? You know, we know in this country that women who are adopted tend to actually be infertile because their adoptive mothers are infertile. That, that's a crazy belief that they hear the mother going, oh, I've got my period, oh, I'm so ill. And then they have exactly the same period that their mother has, even if they're adopted. So when you question a belief and challenge a belief, you no longer hold it to be true. That's why every religion won't l- allow you to question it, because they know that if you question a belief, you're halfway or they're already to not believing it anymore. Mm-hmm. So question your beliefs, get rid of the ones you don't like, replace them with something much better, and you'll have a different life. Um, you discussed recently about, um, well, we're, we're talking in general how society, how we're all ageing, mm. and how there'll be tens of millions of yeah. you know, over 60s around the world. I know you're doing some amazing work on that. Tell me a little bit about you know the new project, Forever Young, and... Yeah, well, Forever Young is a really interesting concept because ageing is a belief that you turn into. So if you were born in Japan and saw your 85-year-old grandparents doing Tai Chi and and doing all kinds of activities, you would age the way they age. If you see your 65-year-old grandparents in the West in an old people's home watching TV going on my knees, I can't remember anything, then you, you turn into that too. So... You know, ageing as we know it doesn't exist because you have three ages. You have the age that your birth certificate says you are. Then you have your biological age, which means that if you're a 40-year-old runner, your heart will actually be 30, but your knees will be maybe 50. And if you run in the sun, your skin may be 60 because your organs age on their own timetable. So if you're active, you'll be younger. People who meditate are biologically 15 years younger than those who don't. Then you have a third age, which is the age you feel. And the age you feel affects the age of your organs. So very happy people have younger organs than very depressed, anxious people. So now we know that what you feel links how you age. You can actually change your ageing. You, know, you, you can live to 105. That You can add at least 30 years to your lifespan just by doing certain things such as not sleeping with your laptop or your mobile phone charging right next to your bed at night but the most effective way to slow down aging is to choose not to believe in it 
Because there's a lot of examples, what I call the new old age. If, you, if, for instance, professors who still lecture at 80 have the same neurons as professors of 30 because the brain is quite brutal. It's what's called use it or lose it. And if you keep using your neurons of your brain, they don't wither. And there's something called neurobics, which I love, which says just clean your toothbrush with the other hand, go up the stairs with the other leg, and you start to fire off different neurons in your brain. Because we all want to look younger, but there's no point looking younger if you feel old. So what Forever Young is is a package of how to look younger, but also feel younger and have a much younger, sharper mind and even slow down the ageing of your hair, maintaining a, an active sex life. There's a lot of things that you can do that will keep you young for a long, long time. To find out more about our latest projects, get a free coaching lesson or download my book, go to www.bernardo-moya.com. I, I, was, um, I was fascinated on this uh, TV uh, program, which you, you also saw yourself. Oh, yeah. uh, tell me a little bit about it. Explain what the process was. was it, they, they did that, was it in the 60s? And they just did it Dr. recently? Dr. Ellen Langer, who I met many, many years ago, because I wrote Forever Young 16 years ago, but I've just updated it. Dr. Ellen Langer took a group of men in the 70s, men and women, to a retreat. And in the retreat, they all pretended it was 1955 rather than 1975. It it was just a 10-day retreat. And before they went, they tested their grip, they tested the length of their finger, they tested their eyesight, their hearing, their balance. And then in this closed retreat, everything looked as if it was 1955, that the films were piped in from the 50s, the magazines from the 50s, the furniture was from the 50s, and they wore badges themselves 20 years <clears throat> younger. And after 10 days, they did all the tests again, and they had all reversed their age by 15 years, even their grip, their balance, their sight, their vision. It was really the most fascinating experiment. It was because they relaxed. So they took another group to the same retreat, but they just relaxed and they didn't pretend it was 20 years earlier and they didn't reverse their aging at all. And the BBC did a copy of this only two years ago and Lionel Bart was in it and Elizabeth Smith was in it and some really interesting... Uh, English people were in it and they pretended the retreat was 30 years younger so it went from 2000 was, I think it was done in 2007 and they pretended it was 1987 and this is, it was, is remarkable some of them went in Liz Smith particularly went in on sticks and within a few days she was walking around and dancing in the garden Sylvia Sims was in there and and halfway through they invited some carers in to, to see if they'd like some help and they also it made them feel incredibly old and they didn't like that at all they sent the carers back but they had the same statistics they had reversed their age by 15 years they were walking without sticks running dancing and what one of them said, he said, I forgot I was old. He said, when I was in there, I really believed I was 30 years younger. And it was incredible. And then the BBC did some even more inter interesting tests where they um, took some people and put them in a simulated flight simulator so that they would believe that they were pilots. And they said, incredibly, their vision changed almost immediately. And they said, physically, their vision couldn't actually change, but their brain, knowing that fighter pilots have to have perfect vision, started to work so much harder to give them perfect vision. So all of those tests, and there are many others, show you that you, you are what you believe. The age on your birth certificate is irrelevant. And that's why you'll see people like Tishan, who is painting into his... 80s and composers are still composing and Lucy and Freud and many people like that who they don't actually grow old the way we think they should grow old they're very active their minds are sharp and if you choose not to grow old I mean I love that expression says when hope dies old age runs to meet you mm -hmm. but if you choose not to grow old you can slow down aging dramatically there's a lot that you can do and my book takes you through step by step everything that you can do it's really easy to slow down physical and mental ageing forever. What do you think are your best assets, Marissa? What, what do you think your best assets are? My best assets, are, I, I, I don't do no. I refuse to take no for an answer. So if I'm told no, you know, when I was told you can't have a baby or you'll never be able to do that, I, I, don't, I don't let that in, which I find very useful. Um, I do let in criticism, but only if it's useful. 
And so I'd say that's probably my best attitude. I, I just won't take no for an answer. And I was studying once um, celebrities because I worked with a lot of them. And I mean, I don't put myself in that category. But what I found out was that celebrities don't take no for an answer. They're very interesting. They simply refuse to do no. And if you say to them, OK, we're having a party, everyone's coming wearing white, they'll turn up in green because they want to be a little bit different. But they don't see it as a handicap. They see it as an asset. And it's a, it's a great thing to not take no for an answer. You know, it, it's the same thing, you know, when you look at what happened in 9-11, those people who were told to stay in the building, the ones that said, I'm not staying, I'm out of here, actually survived. So, and it's the same thing on an aeroplane, the people who won't take no for an answer tend to survive because they don't follow, they lead. And that, that's a good thing to do. Not all the time, of course, but most of the time. And, and, and looking at society nowadays and, and, you know, how the world is, uh, what do you think are the best attributes for you know, of the young, new generation? It doesn't matter how talented you are. If you don't have self-belief, you're not going to get anywhere. If you have extraordinary self-belief, very little talent, you can get everywhere. But if you have both, if you have talent and belief, it will actually make you unstoppable. You know, I work with a lot of football teams and a lot of football players, and a lot of those footballers come out of school at 14, they know they're going to be famous players. They don't really pursue an education. A lot of them have an extraordinary negative self-belief because they, they're only good at sport, which is a great shame. And um, one of my players at the moment has now become a fantastic commentator, but I do a lot of work with him to put in him that belief because he wasn't great at spelling and he wasn't great at school because he knew he was going to be a footballer. So... Belief without talent will take you far further than talent without belief. But if you have both, you can go far. But everyone can learn self-belief. Everyone's good at something. You know, you're not meant to be good at everything. It's no good being a jack of all trades and a master of none. So be really good at what you're good at. And don't worry about what you're not good at, because we're not all supposed to be good at the same thing. Find your talent, you know. Find out what you love to do. What you're meant to do lies directly behind and is absolutely linked to what you love to do. When I was a kid, actually, I loved writing little stories and illustrating them. And it's funny that now I am a very successful writer because I was always writing when I was a kid, but I never considered that as a career. But it, it kind of found me later. My daughter was always drawing and always... Um, and in fact, she went to college to be a criminologist and then gave that up and became an artist because it's what she was meant to do. So find out what you love and be brilliant at it and believe in yourself. We're not looking at generalising here, but what are your thoughts regarding school and education and how you know the youth is coming out of schools and universities? Yeah, I think schools should put... Half their curriculum should be self-belief. We know that in countries like America, where they really teach children to believe in themselves, it, it doesn't work across all, but it works. We know that in, in schools like Montessori, where they teach self-belief, it works. And, you know, our schools spend so much time on things like handwriting and languages and they're very useful but nothing is as useful as self-belief and we also know that you you only learn for three hours a day you can have an eight hour day but you're going to learn in three hours that's it so you should put a lot more time into making children believe in themselves and also goals the very few schools that teach goal achieving find that children really like it and the statistics go way way up so I would love every school curriculum to teach goal setting, goal achieving and self-belief and self-confidence because self-esteem means how much you like yourself. But when you like yourself, you also like other people too. You can't like yourself and not like other people. So a lot of violence and aggression would end if we could just learn how to like ourselves and other people rather than feel dissatisfied with ourselves, which means, of course, you're dissatisfied with someone else. Because if you don't like yourself and you feel dissatisfied, you want everyone around you to be like that too, and then you feel a bit better because you're in the same company. If you don't feel very good and everyone around you is happy, then what you want, what people do is they tend to try and diminish everyone else or elevate themselves. But you can't elevate yourself if you don't like yourself. So a lot of the issues we have in schools, the violence, the truanting, the not achieving, could be cut in half if you just taught children to really like themselves and to have self-esteem. What, um, what would you like to teach others? Uh, what 
what I like to teach other is self belief. I mean, my one of my favourite things is to make people believe that they're enough. You know, I mean, as I said, I work with people who have eating problems, shoplifting problems, shopping problems, phobia problems, and most people wake up and they think, I'm not enough, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not talented enough. And, you know, we live in a world where people are always trying to buy stuff because they don't feel enough. They need trainers and the latest brand because they don't feel enough. When you wake up every day and say, I'm enough, I am enough, it, all that stuff goes away. And, of course, you can't say it once. You have to say it over and over again. So... What I love is to write that on your screensaver, write it on your mirror, write it on your phone. And if you wake up every day and say, I'm enough, I know, maybe I'm not rich, but I'm still enough. OK, I'm not a size 10. I'm still enough. I don't have loads of cash. I'm still enough. As you begin to believe that you're enough, that you're good enough and lovable enough, all of that other stuff goes away. So... That's my favourite thing to teach. I, I teach that to depress people all the time because they never feel enough, that you're enough, that you're lovable just the way you are. It doesn't mean you can't make the best of yourself, but you're lovable. Believe in yourself mm. because no one else can believe in you if you don't believe in mm. you. Absolutely. And no one can reject you if you believe in you. They can mm. criticise you and sometimes you may need that criticism. But, you know... If your boss says you've done a really terrible job, instead of going, I haven't, that's not true, it wasn't my fault, it was their fault, you go, yeah, I can see that I did that, mm, yeah, okay, and thanks for time, I'm going, to, I'm going to fix that. Because you have to have high self-esteem to go, yeah, I can see how what I've done wrong, and, and you, can, you can benefit. So it isn't about arrogance or believing that you're perfect, it's believing that you like yourself. And then you can actually take constructive criticism and benefit from it. Who's who was who's been your biggest influence? Mm, my dad was a great influence because he's a real helper. He's a great guy, and he loved his job. He loved his life. And then the person I trained with, Gil Boyne, he was the most phenomenal teacher. He taught me the most wonderful things. So he's a great influence. Um, lots of people influence me to this day. All kinds of people. But I love people that fight back. I love Simon Weston, the person who got burnt in the Falklands, came back, got married, had three kids, and it it just didn't occur to him that his life should change. So I love all the Olympic athletes this year, the Paralympics. I thought they were phenomenal because they don't do no. They got one leg, so what? I'm going to break a world record. I love that. I love anyone that will come back fighting and 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 don't use what's gone wrong to hold them back, but they just they just keep going. Mm. So I like that, you know, keep going. My last question, what, what would you like your legacy to be, Marissa? Oh, what would I like my legacy to be? Um, that I made a difference. You know, that's a very important for people. We all have the same needs, and our needs are for certainty, diversity, connection, and significance. When you've met those four needs, your, your next need is, is to make a difference. So making a difference is a great thing. Little difference, big difference. That, I'd like that to be my legacy. And that I could teach children in schools to have much higher self-esteem than they have. That's brilliant. Thank yeah, you very much. That would be very happy. Thank, thank you very you. much. And thank you for watching Inspiring People. Thank you, Marissa. That was thank really good. You. Thank good. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. For more information, go to www.thebestyou.co.